It's starting. Okay, right. There's an error. Oh my god, why is it? Live session was the wrong link. Yeah, I'll fix it. Hello? You good? Wait. I have to send all this info to myself. Yeah, it's alive. That's it. It was me looping through like YouTube, which is like delayed. So we're we're live. You can talk. Stop, stop, stop. So you want to click here so I can see the angle of your face. Okay. Um, hi everyone. Thanks for coming back. Um, so the second panel is uh, it's a bit larger than the first. Um, it's five people. Um, four of which are sitting in front of you right now, and uh, one is stepping in uh, as we uh, had done in the previous panel, um, which worked surprisingly well. I don't know if anyone else was surprised by that. Um, so, at, at the end of the last discussion, uh, we were talking about what it might actually mean to use these technologies that we are talking about, and what it might actually mean to us as a person who you know, you know, pays rent, who goes to work, all of these very, let's say, very basic things. Um, so I think this ne this, uh, this panel, which is called uh, Decentralize, uh, shit. <laughs> it's, it's a complicated name. Uh, Decentralized Labor Practices and Distributed Production Networks um, is really taking the idea of, of, the, of the event title, the art of economy, um, it's taking it really head on. It's looking at what does it actually mean to distribute uh, work? What does it mean to distribute relations? Um, and what sorts of uh, what sorts of horizons is that open? Or also, what are the sorts of political complications that, that this brings? Um, so we have, uh, like I said, five um, five different uh, five different presenters, um, and I'm going to introduce them now in the order of their appearance. Um, so first up, uh, we have Christopher Josephson, who um, is uh, by trade a mathematician, um, then worked as a geometer, and is now working uh, for a firm called Block Apps, uh, which is um, closely related to Ethereum and Consensus, one of the main development organizations of uh, the new technology of the Ethereum blockchain that we are that we are working with. Um, then will be Dan Taiyang. Uh, who is an what sort of professor at Columbia? <laughs> Dan Young uh, from Columbia University, uh, GSAP, um, who works a lot. Uh, well, I guess he'll actually tell us about what he works with. Um, then we have uh, Manuel Schwarzberg, who is the uh, director of strategy at the Architecture Lobby. Strategy and Research at the Architecture Lobby, um, a, a new organization looking at uh, labor within architecture, and he will explain more. Um, then we have, uh, Skyping in, like I mentioned, uh, is Jake, um, hold on. Jake Hamilton, uh, who uh, is right now from the Flatiron School, a, a innovative educational program in downtown Manhattan. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, Marina Otero, who is the uh, current director of research and development at the Het New Institute in Rotterdam, which is the former NIE, uh, Netherlands Architecture Institute, uh, but is also one of the five curators of the Oslo Triennial um, coming up in 2016, titled After Belonging. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to the presenters. And yeah, let's go. Yes. Yeah, you sure. Uh, okay. 
so that's being presented. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christopher. Um, as Nick said, my background is in mathematics and geometry. I worked briefly with architecture, and I'm now working directly with blockchain development. Um, I'd like to talk briefly uh, about like one out of four key aspects of blockchains. Um, first, um, I'm working on this project called Ethereum, which is a uh, vast generalization of what the Bitcoin blockchain is. Uh, in, a, in a very uh, rigorous way, you could say that it is the most general blockchain that you can ever create because you can run arbitrary complex transactions on it. Um, I've been, the name Ethereum is not a coincidence. There's an interesting uh, kind of like analogy between the aspirations of Ethereum network and you know the the old uh, concept of ether as this like all pervasive uh, invisible medium through which uh, all kinds of psych psychological and material transact uh, transmissions were uh, conducted through. Um, my interest in uh, blockchains as a mathematician, I think, can be um, presented in three slides. So, uh, the past couple of thousands of years, uh, um, humans were quite satisfied with addition and multiplication, algebra, uh, which is arguably like the foundation of both mathematics but all subsequent fields such as economy and uh, understanding of human society. Um, since three, four hundred years ago, when calculus was in, we uh, introduced what's called transcendental functions, like exponential functions, which are not really explained in terms of addition and multiplication. And this addition, or this, uh, no pun intended, like this, the, the addition of the exponential and transcendental functions, uh, that has modeled natural phenomena through differential equations. Uh, and through that came the explosion of science. Um, I would argue that with the advent of the blockchain, what we're now introduced is cryptographical um, primitive functions, which could potentially be just as like transformative to uh, computation and understanding of nature as the introduction of these other approaches were. Um, Shaw is a, a classic cryptographical hash function, which turn, basically has the, the property that it only goes one way. You take some data, you shaw it, you get a weird number, you probably see these, we call them hashes, and they have the, the property that there's no way for you to understand what was it we started with that ended up as this hash. So it's a non-invertible function. And this is basically the foundational property on which crypt cryptography and, by extension, the blockchain rests upon. Um, by the way, these uh, graphs that I like a lot are made by my friend Tali. These are uh, transaction graphs on the blockchain. So they're kind of pictures of what uh, people and smart contracts do with, to each other when they're sending cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, briefly about what is a blockchain, what uh, it is, and I'm going to focus on the last part of it. Um, from a kind of bird eye view, uh, blockchain uh, consists of cryptographic tokens and addresses. They're based on this SHA hash algorithm that I introduced, um, which means that you cannot uh, forge identities in this uh, system. Uh, it's based on peer to peer networking which creates a decentralized uh, network. that has no central point in it, and if, if it's resilient towards uh, taking down individual peers. It means that if you want to take down a blockchain, you have to take down all of the internet. Um, it's a state machine, uh, which basically just means that it's some kind of like computation going on. On the Bitcoin network, you have a state machine, which is basically just addition and subtraction. You're able to like keep records of who owns who what. In terms of Bitcoin, um, more uh, the, the Ethereum network that I work on has a fully Turing complete state machine, which means that you can perform any an arbitrary complex computation, such as what's running on your operating system or your phone or you know, any other kind of computation that you're used to. Doing. 
And the, the fourth part, which is perhaps the most revolutionary, uh, is that it's a consensus forming algorithm. Uh, so I've been working on the Ethereum project for some six months, been following it like maybe a year before that. And we launched, the project launched a couple of months ago. And what happens was that, so you have all these like thousands of computers that running sometimes the same software, sometimes just like implementing the same algorithm. And every 10 seconds, uh, all of these computers that have nothing to do with each other in terms of like intrinsic goals, they reach consensus on what happened on the, uh, the blockchain automatically. Like no judgment, nothing involved. And these nodes have all the financial incentive to not agree with each other. But the game theoretical perspectives that are built into the foundation of the blockchain makes sense, makes that even individuals or computers with the least financial, uh, financial incentives to not agree at all are forced to agree on each other. And it, it, it ticks like a clock, just like Nick Land was uh, alluding to in his previous talk, like sequence, right? And so this sequence just uh, comes out of nowhere, so to speak. And I think this is really quite interesting. Um, I'm, sorry. And um, I guess I would just like to give us a brief little perspective that I would like you to think about throughout our, uh, what we're talking about uh, later on in the panel. So I'm sure you've heard about miners. These are sort of like the foundational members of the blockchain. They keep wasting all this electricity that's heating up this space. And I don't know, but they're a significant chunk uh, of already uh, carbon uh, footprint. Uh, so the question is, why, why are they doing this? Um, so um, the, the, the reason is called proof of work. It's this algorithm that uh, makes the blockchain form consensus. And it works like this. Uh, every 10 seconds or 10 minutes on the uh, 10 seconds on Ethereum, 10 minutes on uh, Bitcoin, you have a block which has, is a receipt of all the transactions that took place during those minutes. And every single miner has incentive to modify this block for their own benefit, such as like, well, maybe someone just sent me 100 Bitcoins in this transaction. Like maybe I'll just sneak that transaction in there. Or, you know, maybe I... The transaction that I made in the previous block, sending all my Bitcoin to someone, well, maybe I just force them to send them back in this coming block. Um, uh, so the, the the algorithm works as such: like if there's a mathematical problem posed every 10 seconds. Let's kind of assume it's the 10 seconds, and with great probability, this problem, which is totally nonsensical, it's just a math problem. It's going to take exactly 10 seconds to solve for the total uh, computing power that all the miners contribute at that instant. And if you add more miners or subtract, the mathematical problem will change in difficulty. Uh, but in, other than solving that problem, it's totally nonsensical. It doesn't provide you with any good or anything. So people are now trying to find ways to like get rid of proof of work. There's yet to come any. Uh, possible alternative uh, or practical. Uh, so why does this lead to consensus? So when you're solving this mathematical problem, you get priority in saying to what happened at that block. And there's a reward, like in Bitcoin or Ether, and that's why it's called mining. So you get priority, the computer that won that block gets priority in deciding what happened. And if all the other block, uh, miners agree with what happened, then that block is going to be represented as truth. So that this shows why it's not possible to really forge a block. Because if I win the block with a probability that is totally sort of like decided by the algorithm, it's not possible to fail or shortcut, um, and I forge the transaction, the probability that someone else on the blockchain would forge the transaction the same way as I did is practically zero. So if, I, if I'm as greedy as possible, I want to win those Bitcoins, then I have the most rational incentive to just tell the truth. And this gets distributed over the whole blockchain. And so by performing this really tedious work of just 
solving this nonsensical equation, cons uh, consensus is formed on the blockchain. Um, I guess that's the sort of technical explanation. What I would like to, I hope a little bit provocatively, uh, just give a hint of, is the future of proof of work. Um, So a lot of people talk about you know, singularity or what, 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 how our blockchains are going to take over humans' lives. And, you know, the, on, for example, on Ethereum, there's no real distinction between humans and algorithms. You're engaging with algorithms as if they were human organizations. And we're going to see the rise, ostensibly, of decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, and one can imagine a kind of uh, scenario where these algorithms are making trade with each other, kind of independently of humans. Maybe humans are secondary or tertiary to the priorities of these algorithms. And so, um, at the same time, you know, we're, we're talking about like decentralized Uber and such things. So, so humans will interact with these contracts or these uh, decentralized uh, organizations, and we're ostensibly running their errands. And so, there's this kind of like nightmare scenario where like. You know, Skynet kind of situation where algorithms are just like dictating what humans should be doing. And instead of seeing that as a like a futuristic nightmare, I would just like to introduce the idea that well, in that scenario where these AIs or decentralized um, organizations are dominating, they would see an incentive in like uh, abolishing proof of work. Because it's very costly. Like all these machines are running and wasting all this electricity. So, so they might come up with an alternative. They, what, what you need essentially for the consensus, and what we are using this our, the, the, the mathematical problem, which is nonsensical, is just to introduce stochasticity, which is unpredictable from each individual miner's perspective. So you need some kind of randomness. Now, humans are a pretty good source of randomness. So, you know, I might have a kind of predictable behavior in that I go to work every day or something like that. But the exact time at which I go to work is a stochastic variable. And if you kind of quotient out by the right predictable properties of human behavior, you get very good stochastic noise. And so what would a future scenario look like where these AIs or decentralized organizations abandon uh, proof of work as we know it, and they decide to, well, humans are already interacting with the blockchain. Why don't we just take human behavior as the source of stochasticity, and we use that as our consensus forming algorithm? And that might sound really strange, but then think about today. Like you wake up in the morning, you answer an email that you're assuming was written by a human. Right, there's, some, there's a human intent behind it, right? Like you order an Uber because you've got to go to this meeting which your email told you to do. And the Uber driver thinks that, well, you have a real purpose that's decided by a human, so he or she drives you wherever you need to go. Uh, and there's this like layer and layer and layer of human interactions dictated by computers, but with always with the understanding that, you know, there's a human at the top of the pyramid of Uber that profits from it. There's a human that wrote that email out of like emotional, uh, whatever, spontaneity or something. But what if there isn't? And would it really look anything different? Um, that's a quote of a cycle history by Asimov, which I should have shown. Um, what about, I can read it, oh yeah, sorry. I wanted to be a psychological engineer, but we lacked the facilities. So I did the next best, thi next best thing. I went into politics. It's practically the same thing. Um, so I'm not a conspiracy theorist. In, rather, I'm like the opposite. But I think thinking about the worst case scenario of the future as being now could be a promising plateau to think about now. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yep, that's it. Uh, do you, what do you need for this? Yeah. And to excite you all the way at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Dan, and hopefully I will try to be, one second. All right, hopefully I'll try to be as short as sweet and as clear as possible, um, which is kind of difficult because when you think about things and you think you stand inside of the uh, space of what you're thinking about, it becomes so obvious that it's not clear how to explain things. But um, really quickly, negative one point, I kind of think about the intersection of architecture, community, and technology. And right now, personally, I'm uh, stretched between these positions. One is the New York City Real Estate Investment Cooperative, which is essentially a way for people to pull their investments together to create permanently affordable commercial spaces in New York. This is a total shameless plug for that organization. But essentially, it's a large group of people, a cooperative, and there's no us. It's like you could join. That's without trying to create a project and trying to create a space. On the under, other end of that spectrum is a project called Frank Curtis, which um, I'm the architectural designer for, and also the co-founder of, which is a physical space um, that's trying to put people in it. It's, um, uh, an, inten an intentional slow co-working uh, guild for social good. Um, so here we have a space that's in the process of being constructed right now with, that we want people in. On the left, we have a bunch of people who are trying to create spaces. So um, this is more about specula speculations on blockchain as a speculative strategy for making viable cooperatives happen. I'm trying to translate this discussion about blockchain technologies and um, Bitcoin into very kind of materially to turn it on its head, so to speak, and like talk from the base upwards. Um, blockchain technology's impact isn't technological, um, or the main impact isn't, I would say. The spa spatial politics doesn't come from the spatial realm. Financial measurement dominates the spatial realm, property appraisal, valuation, underwriting, dollars per square foot, rates of return, dividend yields. So I don't think it's too much of a stretch to kind of argue. It's not too controversial to say technology's impact isn't just technological. Politics's impact isn't just political. Um, and kind of to kind of encapsulate or abstract away. So blank plus blockchain equals a distributed blank that doesn't need to trust entities. Um, or a blank plus blockchain equals a blank without the need, of trust, need for trust. Or a blockchain powered blank equals a blank that is considered trustworthy. Um, and obviously, if you agree with that, then the interesting point is not the blank. It's the trustworthy part. Because um, from my perspective, and I'm one where I enjoy the competition side of it, and I actually read the Ethereum paper and had my mind blown recently. Um, the technological aspect isn't, it's a replication of whatever existing technologies are out there. It's just distributed and thus without the need for trust and thus trustworthy. So that's just a social aspect of that. And so in some ways, blockchain technologies, Ethereum, all these kind of processes, scripting languages that are built off of blockchain seem to be human distrust burn-off mechanisms. So it turns human distrust, can we trust this? It's a computational dis distrust. Can this algorithm run this really well? And then it burns it off and says yes, you know, with SHA or like all the hashes or all the kind of uh, you know unidirectional um, hatching function that says, okay, the blockchain trustifies things. It trustifies existing programs. So if you have a voting mechanism, it makes a trustified voting mechanism, et cetera, et cetera. And so I want to say the point is then blockchain maybe just adds on to existing technologies and you know has the capacity to become a benevolent technological mediator. So Doodle, I don't know if you know, you can't really see what's going on, but it's essentially, I'm sure a lot of it is used it, you know, you, you use it to synchronize when you're free and when you're not free um, for a date or, you know, at a meeting. Um, but part of the point that Doodle does is, you know, you, you say, I'm the only person who can't make it on the state, and you have the sea of green, green yeses opposing you. And so the benevolent technological mediator of Doodle says, forces you perhaps to consider or reconsider what your schedule is, and you change your schedule based on Doodle. Um, it uses the aesthetics of the spreadsheet and the aesthetics of data to kind of tell you to, to change your mind. Um, Venmo is here because Venmo does this funny thing where it transforms payments between people into these kind of funny, friend, uh, funny friendly things. And I think disproportionately on Venmo, there's like a proliferation of emoji because it's kind of this halfway um, communication for you to give money to someone and have a communication that's not um, uh, in language. But in either way, so. Spatial politics, um, and actually when I was thinking about these ideas, I was mostly thinking about spatial politics and distributed labor. Um, spatial politics is the story of the distribution of capital resources. This is a map of redlining, who gets money, who doesn't get money. Um, and that's kind of dependent on economies of scale. So your bank is too big to fail, 
the economies of having a track record, you know, of you've invested a lot of times before, or the economies of having social capital. You're like a well-known figure in the area, so you can get a mortgage or a loan, so you can build a building, so you can have things happen. Um, so spatial politics comes from finance capital, um, not too surprising. Uh, I won't read this, but this is actually a quote from um, The Art of Inequality, housing, Architecture, Housing, and Real Estate. Uh, where basically over here it says a record um, a record of success facilitates access to capital. A failed project does not really fail unless it hinders its access. It's a quote from a textbook, basically saying, um, "Don't worry. Like your only failure as a developer is if you your access to capital in the future gets removed. So really, you know, access to capital and access to what you can develop, and then thus access to the spatial politics of what is built and what happens in that space is contingent on getting access to capital." Um, so then, risk averse financial models reinforce precedents of what worked in the past, or who worked well in the past, or who has a great social capital in the past. Um, precedents privilege these economies of scale and access in social capital. And this is a quote from uh, Volume 3 of Capital. This is a quote from Volume 3 of Capital, where it says, um, I won't read the whole quote, actually I might as well. Moreover, with the development of large scale industry money capital, so far as it appears on the market, is not represented by some individual capitalist, not the owner of one or another fraction of the capital of the market, but assumes the nature of a concentrated organized mass, which, quite different from actual production, is subject to the control of bankers, i.e., the representatives of social capital. So the point is that you know the people who do the accreditation, not the people, the models, the structure of like how your loan is approved, how your mortgage is approved, what valuation models exist to say, hey, this worked in the past. You know, this will work in the future. That dictates your access to creating buildings. So this is a project called Brooklyn Co-housing that failed in 2012. I think they tried to develop this over three years. The main reason for failure is that no bank wanted to approve a mortgage that was dependent on you know 10 to 30 people putting their capital together to create a co-housing project. This is as like you know it's not revolutionary, it's reformist, but it's a minor you know minor project to say hey let's get together and build a building together and live together. Yet, you know, the, the gateway to like those, the, the reason why it didn't work out is because they weren't able to get a loan regardless of how much equity they had. It's purely the basis of the valuation mechanism that is then based on historical precedent that says this is possible, this is not possible. So then I guess um, the question of what's possible, which I'm thinking about as like viable utopias, they originate from, you know, synchronizing, collectively synchronizing trustworthy, believable processes. So this is um, a great book called uh, Imagine Communities with Benedict Anderson, where essentially his argument is that nations or organizations, organizations like the nation state, are built out of a lot of people who collectively imagine that they all belong to the same thing. And that glue, this like, collective imagination <laughs> called delusion, called optimism, is what kind of coheres the, uh, um, the country together or the organization together. Um, and so that's kind of crucial in generating um, a, a world in which uh, a, a nation state in which you um, you know, become part of the military and are willing to die for your country, or some are, right? Um, if you think about it, that imagination is the collective imagination that you belong to a country is the force that makes people go in and enlist and die for the country. It's like one of the strongest um, forces, powerful. It's not trivial. Um, and so the argument that's pretty simple, I hope, is that if blockchain is this trustifier, right? It just like says, hey, it's distributed and it's you don't need trust, you can just um, uh, use it, and uh, it's, it's, it's totally trustworthy, then it should, and should be able to open up new capital aggregation mechanisms, have new structures for funding, have new structures for Brooklyn co housing to happen, um, essentially kind of reappropriate or borrow or kind of participate in the logic of um, the real estate market, um, which, which, with whichever tool is necessary. So in the way that the architectural rendering kind of you know, gives you the sense of trust by making you believe in a project that doesn't exist yet, the blockchain too could participate in the same, same realm by saying, hey, here's a financial device, it's going to work, don't worry about it. Just put your money in it, it's trustworthy. Um, and if an architecture could learn anything from the blockchain, it should be more about generating collective fictions about viable utopias, um, and speculating wildly about realizable spaces, you know, so kind of speculation about buildability, I think is a uh, Kind of a nice publication, um, and I like projects that manifest, like IKEA's Better Shelter on the left, or the idea of the Hexier project, which is built entirely off of these kind of sandwich foam insulation panels that are thought about, manifested, 
are the total intersection of politics and material sciences and economics and you know labor processes and how to build it, how much it costs, how to ship it, etc. These are made out of four by eight panels that you cut one, you know, like you cut a bunch in half and you tape them together with these giant pieces of tape and they go up together. So um, the speculation about um, realizable spaces, I think, is pretty crucial. And so blockchain and architecture, if if you were if you were to talk about yeah, new spatial politics, it should come from the financial structures undergirding it. Blockchain um, technologies, if they provide mechanisms for trust, then um, that's the possible hope or the viable utopia or the kind of the more short term, I think, goal that is worthy of pursuing um, right now as it is. Um, and as like a kind of a continual shameless plug, this real estate investment cooperative, uh, which I am part of, I mean, this is not my project, this is like I'm part of it, I would encourage all of you to look at it. This is kind of a similar mentality, different technology. This could be, it's probably the furthest away from blockchain um, as they'll ever be because, you know, they're trying to use, they're coming from an art and activism and also real estate background to try to create a, uh, a cooperative um, structure legally to uh, um, have invest in, again, limited profit, permanently, permanently affordable uh, commercial spaces. But I do think that um, th this group, what, what, what they've done is the, they've like participating, they're participating in the real estate market as an equal player and try to find, they're trying to find social and legal mechanisms to complicate models of ownership, otherwise known as like, you know, models like uh, community land trusts and such like that, um, to then make ideal things happen. So I think the very specific application of blockchain onto models of trust that then, you know, um, manifest in different models of uh, investment that then manifest in social capital is pretty crucial. Um, I would say, maybe just to finish, it's the kind of materialist in a Marxist sense of me that wants this wants us to think about this from the bottom up of like where what are the technologies or the kind of processes that undergird how you live your life and how they're funded um, and maybe a provocation to think in that direction rather than top down from the ideal down to the body. Thanks. <laughs> Where'd they go? <laughs> We're on. It's recording, I think. Oh, can they see us right now? It says live. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was on right until the guy, the last guy, finished his talk, and then you got on, and everybody vanished. <laughs> no, it's my fault. No, nah, I doubt it. Coming. Okay, sorry guys, we closed the laptop by mistake and then we got it back up. <laughs> no problem, though. Cool. Okay, we can hear you loudly, Jake. Who's next? Not Jake, right? Okay. But I'm going to put slides. Yes. Presentation on here. You can mute Jake. Can you open his presentation? I don't know which one it is, but I'll try. I don't know which one it is, so we just have to wait for uh, Nick to come back. Uh, what is it called? Uh, this is just terrible, right? Just, yeah, it did it again. There we go. It, this thing is so finicky. It should yes, be moved around. Um,
I'm going to mirror them. Um, yeah. Look. Yeah. Is it on the productive side, maybe? Yeah, it's working. Sir, I can see it here with a little. the center of oikos. What I'm trying to get at here is that the quality of the boundedness of nomos, that is the law broadly construed, creates is, is that, that boundedness is not accessory or marginal to what nomos makes possible, such as domestic work. It is what nomos does as a technocultural collaboration. In our case, part of what is exciting and also challenging about blockchain technology 
is that it makes this quality of boundedness very explicit, whether it is through specific transactions, contracts, or defined parties. That is, they, it delimits them explicitly for reasons of techno-political necessity. So this opens up two interrelated problems or challenges. The first has to do with an old discussion in economic anthropology, the problem of the substantivists versus the formalists. This debate, to be blunt, very blunt, develops Marx's schism between use value and exchange value to ask whether market economics, the implementation of models of production, consumption, circulation, and exchange, effectively destroy underlying human natures and local traditions this embedding the existing ecological and social arrangements for the sake of depersonalized capitalist markets. 